The left is often accused of offering little in terms of advice for men. Right-leaning spaces that rely on essentialist attitudes towards what makes a man or not emerge as the sole repositories of advice for those 14-year-olds who wish to talk to girls and get biceps. Some have argued that the left has let young men down in a sense. Young boys are drifting towards these self-proclaimed unbiased preachers of practical advice, sometimes laced with misogyny and at other times fairly harmless. The left isn't wrong in hesitating to offer such advice on how to be a man. Such advice often relies on the mythically stable idea of masculinity that defines a true man as tough, self-sufficient, sexually dominant, powerful, and successful. Firstly, this supposedly fixed idea of masculinity destabilizes in the face of the diverse ways that masculinity is presented across different cultures as well as within cultures. Secondly, these traits can be harmful, resulting in gendered violence and misogyny for the non-masculine as well as for men themselves, who must constantly try to live up to impossible standards. The latter issue tends to revolve around self-esteem issues that could result in compensatory behavior that, in some instances, end in acts of violence. So why should the left entertain a construct that is so evidently relative and in some instances even harmful and destructive? Some left-leaning voices offer honorable attempts at defining a healthy form of masculinity. However, these lists of traits often appear as easily applicable to any gender. Instead, we are more often than not left with a bland description of what makes a good person. But why can't men simply be good people? Why do some of us insist on striving to be specifically a good man? Is there such thing as healthy masculinity? I wanted to share with you guys a tool that has really helped me set and achieve my New Year's resolutions this year. It's called Blinkist, and it's an app that allows you to quickly and easily absorb the key insights from the world's best nonfiction books. I've always been someone who loves learning and personal growth, but I never seem to have the time to sit down and read an entire book. That's where Blinkist comes in. It condenses the most important information from each book into easily digestible 15-minute summaries. This has allowed me to learn and grow at a much faster pace, and has helped me stay motivated and on track with my goals. One of my resolutions for this year was to improve my time management, and I've been using Blinkist to learn about time management strategies. That's why I've been reading Atomic Habits by James Clear, which gives scientifically proven advice on how to build and maintain healthy habits that will make me more productive. It's been a game changer for me, and I've already seen a huge improvement in my ability to get things done. Now there's also Blinkist Connect, a new feature which allows every Blinkist premium plan to be shared by two different accounts, with no additional cost. This means you can recommend titles and share favorites with each other and get two for the price of one. I highly recommend giving Blinkist a try if you're looking for a convenient way to stay motivated and inspired as you work towards your New Year's resolutions. Get 25% off Blinkist Premium and enjoy two memberships for the price of one. Start your seven day free trial by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code. In a discussion with FD Signifier, a YouTuber who has extensively researched the Manosphere, I asked him why, in his opinion, some people attach so closely to a specific gender identity. Here is his answer. Um, yeah, I, well, yeah. I think it. I think it goes to, you know. So you were saying, uh, what did you say? I immediately thought of this. You said death. Um, so I would flip that and say survival. This, I think, is a pretty non-controversial argument that I believe both sides, the essentialists and the constructivists, could agree on. We are born and in our vulnerable state need to survive. By survival, I don't mean the merely biological. I also mean surviving socially, in terms of self-esteem and acceptance, and in knowing how to perform in the social world. But in order to survive, I need to know who I am. One of the pre-verbal answers to who we are is gender. Society uses a fact of anatomy, genitalia, as symbolic destiny to define who we are. Gender roles assigned to us then give us one potential answer based on a socio-historical slash cultural image of that gender. 
Notably, this image in itself can be largely arbitrary and relative, as evident in the differences in gender roles across cultures and across history. No matter its form, however, gender makes us feel ontologically secure. It tells us who we might be. And for some, this framing is inadequate or incoherent with who they see themselves to be, leading to the development of non-binary or trans identities. But also for a number of individuals, they subjectively experience their gender assigned at birth as an essential and static framework for surviving in the world, and they will continue to identify with this gender for the rest of their lives. For these people, to be slash become masculine is to become an authentic self. Here we can define authenticity under Charles Taylor's terms as involving the creation and construction as well as discovery of oneself. You are not just born a man, but you must also become one through discovery and creation in order to survive. This is the appeal of men's advice that refines what it means to be a man through workout dating and fashion tips. The gendered aspect of this advice speaks to those who truly see their authentic selves as masculine and wish to pursue Taylor's journey of authenticity. To simply offer advice on being a good person or doing good things, regardless of gender, fails to compel those who see being masculine as especially authentic to their selfhood. This pursuit of authenticity is nestled into the very idea of survival. To become a man is to become ontologically secure, to know oneself truly. Is it wrong to encourage this? Is gender not fluid, entirely socially constructed? Now, since this is a video on how to be a man, I need to hit my mandatory mention of right-leaning thinkers, and here I'll introduce Heidegger's idea of thrownness. As an existing being, we find ourselves at any given point always already having become something specific. You exist, for example, as already watching this video as a student, perhaps, or belonging to a certain ethnicity. We are thrown into existence before we are even made aware of it. Now, some of us happen to be thrown as men. One important aspect of thrownness is that it is irrelevant how we came to be thrown. There is no real ground, reason, or guarantee as to why I was thrown into existence as a man. Nonetheless, I am now tasked paradoxically with becoming one. This is a strange situation, as Beck writes. Gendered throwing is peculiar. It is never totally free because it suggests a certain direction, but in modern times there is no compelling reason that he should continue to throw himself as a particular kind of man. Conforming to rigid gender stereotypes can look like enjoying our own oppression in a sense, and conforming to masculinity can also appear like enjoying the oppression of others especially when we look at how much of traditional masculine ideals place women as the subordinate gender. In certain cultural contexts, being a man could be seen as actually being an oppressor, and for some men, they embrace this role with open arms. For others, being thrown into being a man is to find oneself in a precarious situation, especially if they rightfully reject patriarchal norms. No matter the case, to be masculine is to adhere to a rigid script of behaviors, but what these behaviors are shift across time and cultures. In the modern era of gender problematizing, being thrown into being a man can appear confusing and seemingly pointless. At the worst, it can even feel immoral to be a man. In this sense, the left's aversion to discussing masculinity in a positive light is fairly reasonable. Should men even try to pursue rigid gender norms of masculinity? Significantly, Judith Butler, the main thinker behind gender performativity, still honors the decision for some to pursue rigid gender norms. As Butler states, I do know that some people believe that I see gender as a choice, rather than as an essential and firmly fixed sense of self. My view is actually not that. No matter whether one feels one's gendered and sexed reality to be firmly fixed or less so, Every person should have the right to determine the legal and linguistic terms of their embodied lives. Butler is not minimizing the subjective experience of gender as an essential and stabilizing form of ontological security. Rather, Butler is suggesting that the right to express one's gender, regardless of its rigidity or felt determinedness, is of primary concern. 
Butler has identified that gender is nonetheless an integral aspect of identity, even if it was simply thrown to us with no real logic behind it. It does matter for many to feel masculine. If it is a performance, it is one that some care deeply about getting right. The phenomenon of gender euphoria already highlights the psychological importance of feeling at home in one's gender. Often studied in the context of trans and non-binary individuals, gender euphoria is defined as a distinct enjoyment or satisfaction caused by the correspondence between the person's gender identity and gendered features associated with a gender other than the one assigned at birth. Could this be a motivating force for gender identity in general? I feel a deep satisfaction in being called a man. Doing certain things that are culturally endorsed as masculine makes me feel happy, especially when others take notice. It would make sense as to why many young boys seek to refine their competence in areas that would make them feel masculine and give them a sense of gender euphoria, to prove their manliness. It is a subjectively positive feeling to affirm one's identity, no matter who you are. An obvious issue with pursuing gender euphoria through masculinity, however, is that certain gender-affirming behaviors that align with traditional masculinity, such as sexual domination, physical threats, or overworking, can be maladaptive for the individual and society. An ethics of masculinity is required. To paraphrase the stale Victorian advice of John Stuart Mill, my freedom to be a man ends where your freedom to express yourself begins. Of course, this means throwing out the dominating and hierarchical principles of masculinity that are often defined as hegemonic masculinity, those practices that legitimate men's dominant position in society. Healthy masculinity instead would involve men abandoning homophobic remarks and entitlement to sex, insulting other men when they cry, and so on. They could still work the barbecue, go fishing, and arm wrestle, but the fundamental core of masculinity that traditionally seeks to dominate and undermine the non-masculine would have to be tossed aside. What we are left with is an outer core of flannel shirts, beards, and cowboy hats. Masculinity becomes, in a sense, an aesthetic. But how do we deal with the subjectively integral feeling of being a man and simultaneously the idea of masculinity as a mere aesthetic? Isn't there something essential, something natural or true that is captured by the idea of masculinity as an ordering and dominant force? Here is a story from the Shuangzi that might help clarify things. One day a carpenter and apprentice walk by a huge tree, and the young man asks why his master does not chop it down. The carpenter explains that due to its age, anything made from its wood will be useless. Later that night, the huge tree appears to the carpenter in a dream and explains to him that it is in his lack of usefulness that he has been able to grow so large. Describing the more useful trees, the old tree states that their utility makes life miserable for them, and so they don't get to finish out the years heaven gave them, but are cut off in mid-journey. The tree has found a use in uselessness. This runs counter to many men today who, in the pursuit of becoming a man through proving themselves useful, work long hours to the point of physical and mental strain. The rise of productivity gurus and hustle bro culture has only catalyzed this, and research has shown that masculine norms influence work-related stress to a great degree. Unlike the tree, many men believe that their role is to be useful, or in better terms, to be used. Under hegemonic masculinity, such behavior is encouraged. In order to provide, men must work. In order to gain and maintain power, men must work. Hustle culture promotes the collective domination of the masculine at the expense of individual men. Now, what can we take from the lessons of this wise old tree? The Zhuangzi is an ancient Chinese text that was written in a time where various schools of thought, such as Confucianism and Legalism, adhered to strict social and political codes. In contrast, the text itself promotes natural spontaneity and an embrace of emptiness. The Zhuangzi rejects the notion of authenticity, that there is some underlying essence that we can discover or construct. 
to embrace authenticity is to lose out on the adaptiveness of emptiness. The tree, for example, maintains an emptiness by not internalizing social values such as usefulness in human production. Instead, it nurtures an inner emptiness that allows it to survive. This strategy can be called genuine pretending, a topic heavily written by D'Ambrosio and Muller. Genuine pretending is an idea that pops up throughout the text and can be defined in terms of child's play. Pretending here can be understood in the way that children play, that is, without attachment to whatever is temporarily adopted, recognizing both the contingency and transience of transformations. The genuineness of genuine pretending is reflected in child's play as well. Children take on their roles and actually become them, but again only while affirming the contingency and transience of their roles. When kids play, they genuinely perform as their roles. They are sincere and get swept up in the emotions of the performance. However, they never fully become the pirate or the cowboy, avoiding the pitfalls of overcommitting to such social roles. As the authors suggest, this attitude might help alleviate some of the stress and anxiety associated with overzealous overcommitment to social roles. Perhaps more importantly, it also provides resistance against the bad faith of falsely over-identifying with one's social roles. Namely, the child is sincere in his performance up until the point of destruction, harm, or pathological obsession. This is perhaps best summed up by the quote, the usefulness of a cup is in its emptiness. The empty person, the genuine pretender, can be filled with whatever is in their environment, but should always return to emptiness. As they write, genuine pretending does involve adapting to external transformations, but it is not backed by particular goals, intentions, or ideas. The genuine pretender is internally empty, and does not cultivate a full consciousness of being upright or of having an authentic self. In terms of masculinity, there's nothing wrong with striving to be productive. And if somebody is proud of being masculine and wishes to pursue the trait of productivity because they see it as affirming their gender role, there is also nothing inherently wrong with this. But to do this to the point of exhaustion, obsession, or strain is to fail in keeping a healthy distance from masculinity. Rather, we should be like the wise old tree, ready to temporarily shift into and out of social roles and habits in recognition of the transience of our world, for the well-being of ourselves and others. To attach too strictly to one role, no matter how authentic it feels, is to potentially fall prey to their falsities and obsessions. Rather, the role of masculinity should be reserved to the domain of aesthetics, instead of being granted some sort of essentializing inner core. From this, and in contrast with the right, I think that the left can offer advice on the aesthetics of masculinity, Aesthetics, as some have argued, already functions as an important feature in creating one's identity, as is evident in research on aesthetics for trans individuals. Composed of form in terms of what someone looks like, the expressive qualities that are associated with that form, and the meanings derived from the form, aesthetics direct us to certain externalities that solve the gender we've been thrown into, all while maintaining the emptiness that Taoism emphasizes as a strategy for existence. Could men's advice, in terms of fashion, physique, and social expression, that is, the form of masculinity, be enough for these disenfranchised young men? Could left-leaning spaces be critical of masculinity and simultaneously offer advice on the aesthetics of masculinity without relying on the attractive allure of patriarchal politics? Is this delicate balance achievable? In some sense, this emphasis on the aesthetic response in gender is already being practiced. Beck notes that while social differences among gender are disappearing, for example, more women are working in traditionally masculine industries, cultural gender differences are not. The author argues that this is due to the logic of the city and telecity, such as the internet. In these spaces, people become mere surfaces to the gaze of one another, Surfaces can be styled to signify certain genders and sexualities, resulting in a gender game where individuals can choose how much of a man or woman they want to be. This game of aesthetic evaluation, importantly, requires a certain distance to one's gender. 
over-identification can lead to an obsession with proving that we are more than our surface, and it's hard to have fun playing a game when someone starts taking it a little too seriously. In conclusion, we must be comfortable with the possibility that the inner self, if there is one, has no gender. If you wish, dress like a man, walk like a man, talk like a man, but stop when it begins to hurt both yourself and those around you, and don't let being a man stop you from being who you are, which is so much more than you might realize. <laughs>